Hi, everyone. Welcome. We'll give uh, folks a few minutes to, not a few minutes, but a few seconds to load up the room, and, so to speak, and uh, we'll begin our Hydrogen Auxiliaries Best Practices for Hydrogen Safety webinar momentarily. Hello and welcome to today's live webinar series on hydrogen auxiliaries. Today's topic is best practices for hydrogen safety with a focus on generator condition monitors. I'm Rachel Seiler, today's host and marketing communications manager for E1. Before we get started, I have some housekeeping notes. All attendee lines have been muted. We'll be recording today's session and an archived edition will be made available to you uh, on E1's website and our YouTube channel. And upon successful completion of today's webinar, you'll receive a PDF of this presentation, which is very handy to have, and a video that our presenter will reference, as well as a certificate of attendance. And finally, we'd love to hear from you. We've allotted at least 10 minutes of Q&A at the end of today's session. So please make use of this time either through the chat feature or the uh, ask a question feature. And if we don't get to all of them, we'll answer them in a follow-up email. So now without further delay, I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Christopher Breslin, who is Director of Products and Markets for E1's Utility Systems business. He's considered an expert source for information pursuant to critical hydrogen auxiliary equipment serving large Steve steam turbine generators. Christopher has presented at the GE70A user group, Siemens 501 user group, EPRI, and for various utilities across North America. Christopher, take it away. Thank you, Rachel. Hydrogen gas as a cooling medium for large turbo generators began in the late 1930s. There was an increasing demand to get more megawatts out of the generators, which means more iron, and they get physically larger and generate more heat. In order to satisfy the demand for power without increasing the physical size of the generator, a different method of cooling was required. I personally find it interesting that someone, or an entire industry, thought it was a good idea to use a very explosive gas like hydrogen to cool a large machine that has components that are spinning at a very rapid speed and has potential for arcing and sparking. However, we've learned over the years that if proper practices are followed, you'll have no problems and it's an excellent system. Hydrogen's unique characteristics demand constant vigilance by plant owners, operators, and maintenance personnel to ensure safe plant operation. The impact of COVID-19 on the 2020 outage maintenance plans, coupled with recent catastrophic industry events, reinforce the critical importance of robust training and maintenance programs. Today's program centers on your hydrogen auxiliary system best practices for hydrogen safety with a focus on the E1 Generator Condition Monitor, or GCMX. Today, we're gonna to go over hydrogen review. We're gonna go over hazards working with hydrogen. What is a hazardous area? Some hazardous area best practices. What is a GCMX and how does it work? And some of your GCMX maintenance. So the first part is a hydrogen review. It's just like the job hazard analysis we review at the start of shift meetings in the plants. If you've watched the last few webinars, this is review, but as it is critical to life safety, you can never go over it too much. Hydrogen is the lightest element with the lowest density and the highest thermal conductivity. It makes it an almost perfect gas for heat transfer in thermodynamics. It's also the most common element so it's obviously plentiful. It has a concerning characteristic, however, the widest explosive limit of any gas. A concentration of 4% to 76% by volume in air, hydrogen will maintain fire or explosion. 
Hydrogen burns a blue, almost invisible flame. So an ignited hydrogen leak in a line in your plant could be very hard to see, and you may need special tools such as thermal imaging scanners to locate the source of the fire. In a plant, hydrogen is often stored in high pressure cylinders or possibly a high pressure tube truck, but hydrogen can also be created through electrolysis from water right at the power plant. This is common for regular consumption and depending on the specific situation at the plant, like a major outage of multiple generators, you may see hydrogen generators combined with bottle or tube truck usage. There are obvious hazards as noted around the explosive or volatile limits of hydrogen. Here are two examples of what we don't want to see happen. In the upper left, we have a process failure where during the purge procedure of the generator, the exact condition of the generator was misunderstood by an operator and it resulted in the catastrophic failure shown. In the lower right, we have an equipment failure following maintenance of the rupture disc on the bulk hydrogen storage container. During refueling, a faulty element resulted in, a hydrogen, in hydrogen gathering in a portion of the plant that was not designed as a hazardous area and the resulting ignition resulted in the damage shown. Unfortunately, there was loss of life associated with one of these incidents and that's what we really do not ever want to see. I just spoke of a portion of a plant that was not designed as a hazardous area. What is a hazardous area? Well, hazardous areas are places where concentrations of flammable gases, vapors, or dusts can occur. Hazardous areas are classified based on the risk of an ignitable concentration forming in that area. And hazardous areas are also referred to as classified areas. It's the responsibility of the power plant to define the hazardous areas within the plant. And this is usually done during the design and construction phase of the plant. Much of the areas related to hydrogen auxiliaries is often classified as zone two within the power plant. Each piece of equipment that carries a hydrogen gas, hazardous gas, in this case, hydrogen, um, can create a hazardous area in a zone around that piece of equipment. That area is predicated on the risk of a leak forming in the connections within the piece of equipment. The manufacturer follows a code or a standard and defines a bubble around that piece of equipment. A map of the piece of equipment is made as shown on the slide with the shaded area. Within that shaded area is a zone two area around the piece of equipment. And then within the power plant, they've got to look at multiple pieces of hazardous equipment in one area and then a larger piece of the plant becomes a concern for area classification as they're designing the, the space. This slide is a depiction of a best practice to restrict access and clearly label risk of hazardous areas around your plant. The specific photo is of a plant in Indonesia. All of the hydrogen auxiliaries, hydrogen purity monitor, seal oil skid, gas monitor, manifold, um, and hydrogen dryer are located in this area with restricted access and a locking cage only available to a trained people, group of people capable of working there. This level of security is higher than we usually find. However, my colleague Gus Graham says the cage itself is, is common internationally. Uh, I'm used to seeing floor and wall markings uh, as well as hazard signage. Um, throughout the plants that I've been to in the world. We're all familiar with the traditional fire triangle. It's significant to me as I also volunteer as a firefighter. In the traditional fire triangle, all elements, air, fuel, and an ignition source are needed to create a fire. Pretty much everyone's familiar with that. To prevent fire, we're always trying to keep at least one of those legs of the fire triangle from occurring or taking it away from the equation. In the case of hydrogen equipment, the air is just around. We do our best to keep the hydrogen from leaking 
Um, and also, we're always trying to make sure that it's above or below the range of four to 76 percent in air. And we also want to avoid having the presence of an ignition source, just like in the case of the other two, just in case the other two legs go completely haywire. In addition to the fire triangle, more importantly probably today, is this outer triangle. E1 refers to it as a safety triangle. And that safety triangle is comprised of the right equipment, the right processes, and the right well-trained people. We typically find that you, if you have all of these, you're much less likely to ever deal with the results of the fire triangle. Uh, so you're always really looking to, you know, make sure that safety triangle is fully intact, the right equipment, the right processes, and well-trained people. Work in hazardous areas requires appropriate precaution. Operator training is the most critical element of safe plant operation. Adequate signage, identifying the hazardous areas, and what safety precautions need to be taken while working in or around that area are, are very important. And additional signage never hurts. I've seen plants with simple signage at the gas manifold or, well, or and in the control room displaying what gas is currently in the generator during the purge process or even during normal operation. These are best practices and that type of practice could possibly have prevented one of the events shown earlier. A growing element globally, uh, especially in Europe, is the use of qualified EX certified maintenance personnel when working in the hazardous areas. Testing houses such as Intertech, UL, or FM can provide this training called complex training for your maintenance technicians or even your engineering personnel uh, to be used when working on equipment in the hazardous area. Again, Speaking of generator hydrogen auxiliaries, regular calibration of your hydrogen purity meter is critical. You always want to be able to trust your purity reading and ensure it is well above the safe zone of 76%, typically well above that, 90, we're, we typically see 95, 96% in the case. Um, so you wanna make sure you're, you're high and that you can trust the purity coming from your, your purity meter. Strict adherence to the generator purge procedure. This is the most critical time to watch your safety practices around hydrogen. As if done incorrectly, you have an opportunity to blend hydrogen and air in the generator, which could result in catastrophe and has. You wanna be sure that the procedure is kept up to date with any upgrades done to your unit or the piping within your plant over time. I may spend too much time on this point, but to me, it's worth it. Reviewing your hydrogen system P&ID and your purge procedure for your generator before you purge is important every single time. Make sure it's the hydrogen P&ID for the generator you're currently working on, not unit one when you're working on unit three or vice versa. You can easily say, oh, they're sister units or identical, but what if one changed slightly differently than the other since they were commissioned 43 years ago, maybe 35, whatever. But since, since then, maybe something has changed one versus the other. Verify that the valve numbers from your PNID match the valve numbers that you're going to exercise. Walk the lines to be sure they go where you think they're going to go. Create signage to remind you and others which part of the process you're in. Which gas is currently in the generator? Hydrogen, CO2, or air, or possibly you use argon instead of CO2. You may be the crusty operator or INC tech that was there when it all started 43 years ago. Probably not. And it may be old hat to you, but what about the next person when you retire? Or perhaps you are that next person trying to figure out the chicken scratch notes from old crusty. Take the time, ensure that you are the right person following the right process on the right equipment. If your equipment is 43 years old, chances are it may need to retire too. When you replace it, think about the hazardous area. 
it may not have been thought about when your plant was designed, but that is no reason to turn a blind eye. Replace it with modern equipment built to modern hazardous area intent and update your documentation as appropriate. Next, use only spark-free tools in the hazardous area, such as aluminum, bronze, or copper beryllium alloys that will not create a spark, which brings us back to avoiding one leg of the fire triangle, the ignition source. These tools will typically not last as long as standard tools and should be watched for wear. And finally, adherence to your OEM prescribed maintenance on all equipment that is operating in the hazardous area is imp important for safe, and efficient plant operation. So we've got some stresses going on in our industry right now as well. The generator fleet is obviously getting older. The hydrogen auxiliary equipment is getting older. Our workforce is getting younger and leaner. And that's a change that's happened in my time in the industry. When I first started, our workforce was an older workforce. And as they're retiring out, now we're getting to be younger, and like most every industry, it's just always getting leaner. We're finding that training programs are less frequent. The time between outages are getting pushed out. And now with COVID-19, that continues to affect the outage maintenance schedules in 2020, taking things that were possibly scheduled for this spring and pushing them to fall. And then depending on what happens, that fall may push to next spring and what will be the long-term effect uh, on, you know, from that. These factors increase the importance of a well-managed hydrogen auxiliary maintenance program. All right, the remainder of today's program will focus on the generator condition monitor, explosion-proof design, or the GCMX, as well as some complementary asset protection devices. The GCMX is used to detect generator overheat or hot spots. Thermal decomposition of organic materials such as epoxy paints, core lamination enamel, or other insulating materials used in the generator is detected by recognizing submicron particles emitted in the de decomposition process. GCMX can be used in any generator cooled with hydrogen gas. E1 makes a similar piece of equipment for air-cooled generators. However, that is not the focus of today's discussion, and it uses a different technology. Typically, when proper operating procedures are followed, large synchronous electric generators are very reliable. However, generators can and do fail. Many generator failure modes are common and can be pre predicted or prevented. Some examples of why generators can fail are design flaws, operator issues, contamination or foreign material, or because of mechanical or electrical stresses put on the generator. This is a picture of a generator with end winding issues uh, caused most likely by vibration. Some failures cannot be prevented, but early detection of the problem followed by prompt corrective action can mean the difference between a brief shutdown for minor repairs and a major overhaul involving weeks or most likely months of costly downtime. This is a picture of a generator that experienced a core failure. Early detection of this problem could have minimized the damage done to the generator. As we discussed earlier, today's operating conditions increase the chances of generator failures. Generator fleets are getting older, periods between outages are getting longer and longer, the generators are being cycled more, and sometimes the grid can be less stable due to renewable energy, and the power industry workforce is getting leaner. All right, how does my GCMX work? Well, the principle behind uh, detection in the GCMX is ionization or an ion chamber. The ionized gas will transmit current when voltage is applied. Submicron particles from degradation, the hot spot, impede the flow of current. And the GCMX output is related to that subtle change in current, which subtle, it's measured in picoamps, so it's, it's pretty small. 
consistent hydrogen flow, consistent hydrogen flow is an important factor as well. Now, I blew through that slide, and if you feel like you want more, the detail's coming. Uh, the hydrogen goes everywhere in the generator, around and through cooling passages, in the rotor and the stator, behind the stator, around, around the end windings, through heat exchangers, uh, around the, the bushings and leads, everywhere to the inside edge of the seals, everywhere inside the generator is hydrogen. And the GCMX detects overheat anywhere that the hydrogen touches. So it's very much a global detector inside of the generator. And under normal operation, there are no submicron particles from that degradation in the cooling gas of the generator. So it's either there or it's not there. And in normal operation, it's not there. So just to give a little bit of a, a customer feedback, uh, success story, whatever you want to call it, uh, can't name the plant or anything, but this is you know exactly the note we received. And it says, our unit two had severe core damage and some insulation damage, which caused a shutdown in summer of 2017. It was detected by the GCMs since we have two on each generator and we reduced power to plan for a shutdown. Also, the core embedded TR RTDs showed an increase in temperature after GCMs first detected burning. During that shutdown, we did as much state of repair as possible. Then it continued. Prior to our December 2018 refueling outage, where we changed out the stator for a new one, I noticed the GCMs were indicating a slow but continuous drop in particulate concentration down to 68% range. When we finally shut down and removed the rotor to change out the stator, we noticed areas of burning and overheating in small but noticeable places in the core. It did not have long to live and the GCMs were letting us know. We made it to the outage, but just in time. And that's, that's a good story where, you know, they're talking in the first half about the fact that they're, you know, decreasing load and power in order to be able to continue to run and plan for a shutdown. That's some of what we're looking to be able to allow you to do with your, your GCMX. Uh, interestingly, the GCMs they had on this, this system were old GCMs, not even the modern ones with all of the great electronics that you'll learn about in the next few slides. Um, and they've actually since upgraded a couple of those at that plant uh, since this time. All right, so I've been talking about ionization. The heart of the GCMX is the ion chamber. So you're gonna see a lot of it in the upcoming slides. Many of you have a GCMX today, but for reference, if you're not familiar, the ion chamber is a little over three inches in diameter and about a foot long. The inlet to the GCMX and therefore the ion chamber is attached to the generator fan pressure side of your fan in your generator. After the hydrogen flows through it, it goes out the outlet and it's gonna return back to the generator fan suction sides. So the fan DP of your generator actually drives the sample um, through the GCMX day in and day out. There's really no working parts, which is one of the reasons that this piece of equipment can just stand vigilance successfully year after year after year watching your generator. Before we dig into the ion chamber itself, let's look at the overall system. This is just a simple diagram of the parts of the GCMX. I mentioned that the gas is gonna enter from the generator fan pressure tap, come through the inlet. It's gonna go through this solenoid valve up and around this verification filter that we'll talk about in a few minutes, down through the ion chamber, out and back to the generator through the generator fan suction. Right here is a little flow set valve. We utilize that to set the flow through the ion chamber utilizing this DP transmitter. That gets set to 1.5 and you'll see that several times. There's another solenoid valve and a collector that allows us to actually take a sample of the hydrogen gas um, whether it's a baseline sample or if it's a sample because you have an alarm. And again, this is the explosion proof model. So all of the system electronics are located in an explosion proof junction box, which allows it to be uh, used in the hazardous area. First, I'll show how the ion chamber works with clean hydrogen. This is kind of the principle behind it. 
Again, the hydrogen enters the ion chamber through the gas inlet. It is then diffused. There's a small alpha source in the ion chamber and these positively charged alpha particles are drawn to a negatively charged electrode. It's got a negative 10 volt DC charge on it. And that results in a small measurable current. Again, picoamps. We then amplify this signal to create our GCMX output and we set that to, uh, I'll call it fictitious, but we just set that to an 80%. So there's like a normal output and that gets set to 80%. We go into a warning at a factory set 70% uh, and begin to verify an alarm at 50%, uh, which we'll show the process of in a few slides. You have to have good hydrogen flow. I mentioned in the last slide, we set our hydrogen flow to 1.5. And as you see, this normal operation, we've got an output in the range of 80%. And if we have that 80%, we know that the unit is working properly. So now we'll show what happens if we have overheating. When we have thermal degradation of organic materials inside the generator, millions of submicron particles are created. Now, I've got it drawn here with polka dots, but it's not polka dots. It's literally millions of submicron particles. They go everywhere and they, they go everywhere that the travel, the hydrogen travels immediately. And they'll basically begin to hit the ion chamber just based on the flow rate and the distance from the generator. And that's one of the reasons that E1 recommends that you install your GCMX as close to the generator as possible and often right on the turbine deck next to the generator. Since these particles go everywhere uh, in the generator, the GCMX will tell you if you've got a problem, if you've got this overheat, but it will not tell you where your problem is on its own because you don't know if that particle came from somewhere in your lead box or if it came from your end winding, it ends up in the hydrogen and it just goes to the GCMX and it says you've got a problem. To get more detail on location of the hotspot, you can use tagging compounds in the epoxy paint. There are five sets of compounds, one for the collector end, turbine end, rotor, core ID, and the bushings. And some plants have actually just used their knowledge of the generator operating parameters and the output of the GCMX to ramp up and down different parameters to help them identify where the issue could be within their generator. All right, so now let's look at what happens inside the ion chamber when submicron particles are present. These submicron particles are heavy with respect to the alpha particles in the ion chamber got very low mass, but again, with respect to the alpha particles, they've got weight. So the alpha particles attach to the submicron particles, and now, rather than being attracted to the negatively charged electrode, they actually will pass right out through the output. So that's going to give us a drop in current, and therefore a drop in our output. So as we see here, we still have our 1.5 flow, but our output has now fallen down close to zero because we no longer have those alpha particles attaching to the electrode. When the output drops below 50%, the verification process will begin. Again, just taking note that we still have consistent flow. All right, so let's look at the, the normal flow path that I discussed in the system diagram a few slides ago. Again, quickly, it just comes in. It goes up and around the verification filter, down through the ion chamber. Again, working on both sides of this differential pressure transmitter to measure flow and back out. So normal setup, 1.5, and our normal output. Now, we've got the overheat condition happening inside of my generator. And so I've got particles that are flowing in. It's following the exact same path, up, around the filter, down, through the ion chamber, and out. But on its way through the ion chamber, those particles are passing right back out, like we said, and they're taking those alpha particles with them. And so now, while I've still got my flow, my output 
has decreased to below 50%. And now the verification sequence is initiated and it's a three point check. Filter solenoid operates and changes the path to flow through the verification filter. The filter is intended to filter out particles, so we expect the output to go back up to normal or above 60. So this solenoid opens up now and that starts going through the filter and it's an absolute filter. Our goal is to filter out the particulate and we expect to see what happened here. So we insert the filter and our output increases again because now the alpha particles are attaching to the electrode again. There's our second point. The solenoid now removes the filter from the path again. And if the output then drops again, because again, the ion chamber is now seeing the submicron particles, the alarm is confirmed or verified. Our output again drops down below 50. This verified alarm is what we've been waiting for, but we never actually want to see because this is when we know that something is, is awry inside of our generator and we've got some sort of overheating condition. If you have your sample setting set to auto, the sample solenoid will now open and draw a sample through the collector, which has a filter media inside of it, and then the hydrogen passes out to vent. It passes to vent to ensure that regardless of what you're doing with your generator operation, if you bring it down, et cetera, the case pressure can drive an adequate sample without affecting the operation of what you're doing in the plant. And that sample can be sent back to E1 for analysis. And again, you can see that we still got our dropped output. So the GCMX is still doing its normal job and in parallel to it, we're collecting that sample. This is a sample data sheet. So when you take that sample, this piece of, of uh, paper is very, very important to us here at E1. We wanna know who you are, what plant you're, uh, you're coming to us from, what your collector number is. And so interestingly, there's a collector number written on the cardboard container. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Um, but I'm looking for the collector number that's actually in the collector itself. Um, we then want your part number, which these days is a GAO 349 GO1. That should actually be filled in from the factory because we actually send a copy of this sheet out with your collector when it comes to you. And then we want to know your generator ID, how you call it, the manufacturer of your generator, your generator condition monitor, serial number, the sample date, sample time, what was your load at the time of the sample, your hydrogen pressure, your hydrogen purity, hot gas and cold gas temp, AKA going into the cooler and out of the cooler, whether that sample was taken in an alarm or a non-alarm condition. Uh, if you're able to give us your chart readings, it's really great for us to be able to get some data from your historian. And if you're, most of the time they're doing this with the fil filter button not depressed, but if we know that you were filtering out the particles or not filtering out the particles, it is helpful. And then the sample flow, there's a little flow meter on the output of the, uh, the collector. If you can read how many liters per minute that is, that's helpful as well. And then your sample duration, that's set from the factory at 10 minutes and per the manual and the instructions that come with this, we typically ask you to take it three times for a total of 30 minutes. And then do you have tagging compounds and any, compound, uh, any comments? And again, if it is a result of alarm, if we could get a chart from your DCS showing the output and flow of the GCMX and any other things like your load, your VARs, et cetera, at the time of the alarm, it can be very helpful for us in the analysis to see what's going on conditionally um, with your generator. All right, so that's kind of it on the GCMX until we get to maintenance. Now we're gonna talk about some other incremental asset protection. Condition monitoring devices like the GCMX are important tools in risk mitigation. As risk factors in the fleet increase, additional monitoring becomes necessary. So in addition to your standard OEM equipment that came with your generator, 
you may want to be adding some additional protection in the future. And what types of risk factors? So for the third time today, we're talking about risk factors or industry stresses. And again, what are they? Age of the generator, size of the generator, criticality of the generator to the fleet, operator experience, and plant staffing level. The basic stuff coming with your, your generator from the OEM, just basic temperature sensors. They can give you some indication of overheat, heat exchanger failure, and insulation failure, uh, but typically slow. And if that temperature sensor is not right where the overheat is, it may not ever find it. Um, overload protection for overcurrent, some vibration monitoring, have your shorted rotor turn, but it can be used for a lot of things. It can show you, you know, shaft imbalance, um, you know, movement that's happening in your end windings, et cetera. There are a lot of things you can see with your vibration monitoring. And then again, this is a hydrogen cooled generator. So your hydrogen purity always coming um, from the OEM and that's directly related to safety and in certain units, you can actually find out a little bit of information about faulty seals. So some additional condition monitoring equipment that you may add later, again, as, as your, your risk level increases. And all of these things, if it was my generator, boy, if, if you could have everything, it would be great. Um, so fiber optic accelerometers, helping you with end turn vibration, partial discharge, helping with stator insulation breakdown, flux probes, looking for shorted rotor turns, radio frequency, and the appropriate person that knows how to interpret the radio frequency. That one seems like uh, it takes some special people to do that, but they find some awesome things. Uh, that can help you with arcing, dew point sensors uh, to measure the moisture in your hydrogen, and the GCMX looking for overheat and or arcing. So how do these complementary protection things work? As I said, I look at them as complementary, not necessarily competing. So Say you're doing PD failure detection. Well, PD is gonna find interstater, interstater bar issues, stator bar to bar. It's also gonna look for corona in my interns and look at bar to ground. If I'm using RTDs, the RTDs will find that bar to ground. They'll also look at my stator heat exchanger blockage, uh, stator core hotspots, but again, can be a slow response depending on how many RTDs you have, where they're located related to what's happening in your generator. And then the GCMX, which can also find that corona uh, in the interns, also see that bar to ground, find that stator heat exchanger blockage and the stator core hotspots faster than the RTDs, also find back core burning, shorted rotor turns, foreign material, mechanical vibration, and blocked rotor cooling. Um, so again, all of these things can complement each other. As you can see, they overlap each other in what they do in the middle. Um, and if you had multiples of these and two of them were telling you of a problem, it makes it easier as an operator to decide that you've got to make a decision um, versus just one piece of equipment that you may not have heard from in years. So knowing your GCMX, where do I find my model and serial number? The system nameplate is located right here on the inside of the front door of the enclosure. Critical to us is your model and your serial number to ensure that we uh, give you efficient problem resolution and accurate spare part support within our service group. While we've got this door open, here's that differential pressure transmitter we're using to, to set flow. That's that flow set transmitter. So as I'm setting flow, I'm twisting that to the right or left, getting 1.5 up on this screen, as well as on the bar graph that would be on the front side of my door. This is the sample collector. Again, really only critical to you um, when it comes time to take a sample. And there is some information Chad shows in the video that everyone will get access to, how to change out that collector, how to take a sample. Uh, this is the flow that we're looking for you to load onto that sample data sheet. And you see these two cardboard tubes. There's a lot of questions on these. When this arrives at your facility, one of these is empty and people often go, hey, I got an empty one. Well, that's the one that matches up with this collector that's installed in your unit. So when it's time for you to take your sample, 
you should match the empty one to that collector. They actually should have the same collector serial number on them, fill out the data sheet, everything stays together and comes back to E1. I recommend you leave these right in your unit because here's your spare. So when you take this one out, you put it in here, you send it back to E1, you come over to this one, you take the collector out, you install it. You don't have to chase around your facility. We don't mind because quite honestly, we sell a lot of these collectors because they get lost. Um, but it, it's not a bad thing to just leave it right in your unit so you always know where it is. It kind of follows along with a lot of the success principles that we talk about these days. So knowing where to find the critical information. On your GCMX display, you've got a multifunction LCD that allows operators to quickly gain access to critical information about the GCMX. Refer to the software manual and the, the video from Chad. Chad will walk through how to, uh, to go through these menus. So we've got to keep an eye on this thing. So every day when you go through the little operator walk, we want to do an LED check. We want to verify that your trouble LEDs aren't lit. And on this piece of equipment, there's actually three of them. One for GCM fault, one for a flow fault, and one for the sampler being on. We want you to verify that your AC power light is on and that your safe light is on. Again, every day we want you to go through and check and adjust your flow to 1.5. As you can see on this one, this one's lagging a little bit. So if I was the operator walking up to this today, I'd see that and go, hmm, and I'd watch. Sometimes it, it'll go up and down a little bit, but I'd probably open the door, find that flow set valve, and turn it until I got myself set back to the 1.5 on the DP uh, transmitter and also on this bar graph. And again, your output should be at 80%. So as you can see, this output is actually sagging a little bit as well. And that's probably sagging because it was set to 80% when the flow was at 1.5. So with the little bit of flow decrease, I also see a little bit of output decrease. So making sure that you're keeping these things in check day to day is very important for the successful operation of your GCMX. Also in the weekly checklist, we want you to blow down your oil moisture trap. Um, typically you have one of these on the inlet of the GCMX. Some people actually install them on the inlet and the outlet of the GCMX. Uh, but one comes with each GCMX and is typically mounted at the inlet. And we ask you to blow down that oil moisture trap, use a container to collect any fluid, and be very careful to follow your plant safety protocol for the presence of hydrogen gas, because when you blow this down, you're gonna be uh, expelling some hydrogen gas in the process. And you can see it's got a grounding strap. Make sure you hook all of that up uh, so that you maintain your grounds in, in the entire process. Also on your weekly checklist, we look for you to depress the verification filter. There should be little to no change in flow or output. So when I press this button, I should see that the flow and the output essentially remain where they are. If the flow drops by 20% or more, the filter may be restricted. And if the output increases significantly, particulate may be present in your hydrogen. So that's something to watch out for as well. As you're going through your calibration, you may have just very, very minimal and if you find that when you press your verification filter, your output increases, and that's something you should be thinking about and consulting with your E1 service technicians. And then checking the faults log, ensuring no faults are present. And uh, that's gone through clearly in Chad's video that you'll have access to. Every month, we look for you to perform the relay test. You can see your software manual or Chad's video to see how to do that. The thing I recommend is whenever you're working on this, make sure you're communicating with the control room because uh, you may send some short term signals up there and you just want to make sure that they're expecting that because you never like to see unknown alarms when you're working in the control room. Annually, we recommend that you check the tubing connections, activate the manual sampler. And then we've got some basic GCMX FAQs um, everyone's going to get a copy of this, so I don't need to, to go through this with you. Um, you know, you may have some of these questions on the Q&A section uh, coming up, but you will get these. Just talks about, you know, connecting it to the same generator tapping points. Uh, well, actually, I'll do the second one. Can it interface with my DCS? Yes. It's got two 4 to 20s. Uh, we'd really like you to hook them up. One for the ICD output, one for flow. 
three output relays, one for the warning, one for trouble, and one for the verified alarm. Uh, hooking that stuff into your DCS gives you the best visibility. We had a GCMX that did its job many years ago, and the plant still had a problem because they didn't hook anything from the GCMX into their DCS to know that the GCMX was alarming. Um, so while the GCMX did its job, nobody knew it was doing its job and they still had a problem. So, all right, so today we reviewed the hydrogen properties. We discussed hydrogen hazards. We defined hazardous areas. We discussed some hazardous areas best practices. We reviewed the function of your GCMX and we walked through the basic manual GCMX maintenance. And with that, I will open it up for questions. Okay, Christopher, thanks so much for that very informative presentation. As Christopher mentioned, we'll open it up for questions. So get them going and we'll do our best to answer all of them. Uh, right now, Christopher, um, what size generators can use a GCMX? It's a good question, Rach. Um, the, it really does not matter. It's a choice for you. Any hydrogen cooled generator can use it. We've got them operating on, um, you know, nukes um, at, you know, 1200 megawatts. And we've got them operating on units down to 25, 30 megawatts. If it's a hydrogen cooled generator, the GCMX can actively monitor for hotspots. Okay, very good. And um, you kind of touched on this a little bit, but uh, it does need, in my opinion, reiteration. So if my generator already has RTDs or thermocouples, why do I need a GCMX? Okay, that's, that's a good question. All right, so I talked a little bit about complementary technologies. Um, your generator is gonna come from the OEM with some factory pack of RTDs. It, it might be eight, it might be 16, um, 32, 96. You know, the more you have, the better, obviously, resolution. Um, but those RTDs are in specific locations. And some of these hotspots, they're, they're very, very small. Uh, you may have something that's just a, a couple of square inches of overheat happening in your generator. And if that isn't happening right near that RTD, the RTD signal is not going to change. Um, but again, with that hydrogen passing over every piece of the generator, that little particulation that happens from that couple of square inches will end up in the hydrogen and the GCMX will be able to, to alarm for that. Um, you may still see it in your RTDs and that would be great because if you have two pieces of equipment that respond similarly, it helps you make your decisions. Uh, but those RTDs are typically much slower response um, and they're not necessarily everywhere. You don't have RTDs sitting on the back of your core, et cetera. Um, so the GCMX is more of a global monitor. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, we have another question that says, thank you very much for the very informative presentation. Does seal oil purity affect the GCM reading? Seal oil purity. Uh, I'm not sure I know exactly what they're talking about there. I'm thinking that it might be um, in relation to like a scavenging seal oil um, generator where you're measuring the purity of the hydrogen out at the ends, collector end, turbine end, like on our dual hydrogen control panel. Um, but the oil question is a good question. Um, oil mist is not going to create a verified alarm here. Now, oil getting into the GCMX can cause problems. Um, if you flood the unit with oil, that's one of the reasons we have the oil moisture trap. But oil mist is not going to give the same signal output that you would get from submicron particles. So that's really not going to have an effect um, on the, the output. If you're getting a verified alarm, it truly has to be particles of um, decomposition. Now, if oil is burning off inside of your generator against a hot spot or warm spot, the GCMX will definitely alarm and verify an alarm. And that may not mean that you have insulation burning or whatever, but there is something burning. And it's probably because of that abnormal situation 
where you've got oil in your generator where it wasn't supposed to be. Gotcha. A uh, question from Brandon. How often do you recommend uh, sending a sample in to E1? So that's a good question, Brandon. Um, if, if you've got a situation going on and we see that there's an alarm, we may do regular samples. Uh, we have a lot of customers that will send in samples on either six month or one year intervals. Um, when we're filling out your collector reports, we're typically saying, you know, send another sample in in six months um, and see what's going on when, whenever you've got something that is a little bit awry. If you've got perfectly clean sample after sample after sample, uh, once a year is definitely sufficient. And there's some people that really don't send in samples. The positive part of getting onto a regular cadence of sampling is that the GCMX typically has a champion at the plant that understands what the piece of equipment does. Because the worst thing that can happen for this is for it to sit there for years and years and years and nobody really knows what it does. And then one day it goes into alarm and everyone looks at each other and goes, does anyone know what that is? And I think that's actually the biggest benefit of the sampling is having a champion that understands what the piece of equipment is and what it does. Um, so we recommend once a year as a, uh, a good, good point for that. And in terms of a follow-up uh, to that regarding, um, you know, a, a yearly analysis, does the verification filter need any maintenance? And does it have to be replaced at a certain point in its life cycle? Yeah, so that's a, another great question. Um, that was one of the maintenance items we said about pressing the verification filter button. And it is uh, in Chad's video as well. So you'll see Chad go over how that process works. But when you press the verification filter um, button, you want to make sure that everything stays the same uh, as far as flow and stuff. But if you see a decrease in flow when you press the verification filter button, it typically means that it's clogged and it's time to replace it. So that's one of the reasons we have you, you do that test is it will help you decide when that needs to be done. Okay, um, a question from Alejandro. Um, in the tag for the GCMX info is, so I assume he's talking about the tagging compounds. Um, is there space for special coatings applied? Are they traceable differentiation for the different generator areas? Um, okay, so that is a, a good question. And it does sound, I wasn't sure if he was talking about the- um, Yeah, I don't know if he's talking about gen tags or, yeah. Yep. So the gen tags, um, again, there's five different sets of compounds. There's one specifically, the way they're developed, there's one for the collector end, one for the turbine end, one for the rotor, one for the core ID, and one for the bushings. Um, so when you get an alarm and we get the submicron particles that come through, in that sample, in the lab, we can actually test and see which one of the five compounds uh, show up. So then we would know that that overheat happens on which section. Now we have had plants that have known they've got a problem in a specific section of the generator. Um, and they've actually painted all five of those compounds and made their own map of where they went. And it just allows them to tighten up where they're, where they're measuring. Um, so you can use them as, as you want, essentially. Uh, but there are five independent compounds that get used. OK, thank you. Uh, and I hope we answered that uh, to your satisfaction, Alejandro. Um, a follow-up question uh, at the beginning of this Q&A session um, was from Matimba regarding the, um, the seal oil purity. So um, they're saying that the seal oil that seals the generator hydrogen from escaping through the rotor seals. We usually have challenges with this oil purity because it's shared with the bearing oil that gets contaminated. So the contaminants end up inside the generator so the question was about how these impurities in seal oil may affect the GCM reading. Okay, so still, still kind of falls down there. Um, obviously, we're not looking to have oil inside of our, our generator case. Um, if you do get oil truly inside of your generator case and it flows down the path uh, of piping to the GCMX, um, it can flood it and that would definitely affect the the function of the GCMX. 
Um, so we, we recommend that people follow proper piping practice and on the inlet and the outlet of the GCMX install drip legs to prevent that from happening, as well as that oil moisture trap. I, I didn't mention it in the presentation, but only the oil moisture trap that's provided by E1 should be used for that. Um, it's designed to be able to filter out the oil and the oil particulate, but let the submicron particles through. If you just install a regular coalescing filter or something like that, you'll filter out the submicron particles and basically you know, avoid your GCMX being able to, to work and tell you of the things. Um, that is, unfortunately, it is common to see that shared, um, that shared oil system, but it's not really gonna have an effect on the GCMX unless the oil gets into the generator and flows down the pipes and affects it, or again, burns off inside of the generator, which actually is something that you'll wanna fix. Um, so it'll be good to know if you're burning oil off inside. Hope that answers the question, sorry. And feel free to reach out to me independently afterwards to go more in detail on this. My contact information is up on the slide right now. I'm not getting any sound. Can you hear me? I hear you now. Okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, so this is a question from Christian with apologies. Um, with reference to the IDC current, what would be an expected change in reading and in what direction when the verification filter is and is not in place with a clear hydrogen sample? Conversely, what change in reading and direction would you expect if there was particulate in the hydrogen gas, again, with and without the verification filter in place? So okay. They yeah, it, and it really, it's pretty much exactly the slides and maybe I'm misunderstanding. I, was that Christian, I think? Um, so again, when the particulate, so let's just call the normal picoamp reading um, coming off of the ion chamber as two and a half picoamps. So normal, you've got about two and a half picoamps feeding back to the electronics. That gets amplified and turned into our 80%. When the particulate comes through the ion chamber and passes through, that reading is going to drop drastically, um, close to zero. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a drastic drop, and we will see the output drop essentially to zero. You can see output lagging down, like when you get an output that's lagging down to 65 or 50 percent, you got to work through that with our service people and try to figure out what's going on. Um, sometimes there's outside influences there, but when you've got a real overheat, it's typically drastic and it will drop all the way to zero. When you insert the filter, whether you do it manually or it's automatically, but when you insert the filter, you would expect that output to rise back up essentially to normal, at least over 60%. So when it's just like the verification process, when it drops below 50, it starts the process and it normally is not like 49, it's like five. And so it drops all the way, insert that filter, you would expect the output to increase back up to essentially the normal level. And then when you remove the filter, it will drop back down. I hope that that answers your question, Christian, but that's essentially, you can do it manually with the filter, but that's the, that's the verification process that automatically happens in the GCMX by the electronics today. Okay, thank you for that, uh, Christopher. And um, it looks like we're just about out of time here. I know we have some questions um, that we'll answer offline as well. We thank you for submitting them. And uh, Christian says many thanks to you, Christopher. So uh, on behalf of all of us here at E1, we thank you for joining today's session and we look forward to seeing you soon. Please be on the uh, lookout in your inbox uh, for once again, a PDF of this presentation, as well as a link to the video. 
um, that Christopher referenced throughout this presentation and your certificate of attendance. So thanks again and be well, everyone.